So I sat down on the steps of Alice Robertson Middle School next to my dad, and he looked over at me and he said, how, how, how did we get into this mess? I can explain. So I, I wasn't good at math in eighth grade. Okay, well, I wasn't good at math in any grade, but this story just happens to take place in eighth grade. Uh, to, truthfully, I, I was in Algebra 1, which I had no business being in in eighth grade. I should have been in pre-algebra, but my parents and I both agreed together that this would be a good challenge for me. It wasn't. Sometimes playing up makes you stronger, and sometimes it ruins your life. So I, I, I worked hard, and I studied all semester, but I just, I just couldn't get it. It just did not make sense to me. You know, looking back, I, I think it was probably the first time that I truly failed at something, which they say failure gives you character, right? But in the middle of failure, you don't want character. You just want to know the function of X. And so here I was, halfway through the semester, and I knew I was just toast. And with a test looming and me way in over my head, I, I got desperate. So I sat next to this kid uh, in class. We'll call him Mark because that was his name. And Mark was a guy, Mark was a guy who somehow he could just get you stuff. He was, he was a guy on the inside who just knew how to work the system and come up with things. True story, years later, Mark would be the first person I knew with a CD burner and Napster, which meant that for $20, Mark could get you a CD, a compact disc with Mambo Number no. 5 and Limp Biscuit on it. Oh, waka kaka. So I, I, I approached I approached Mark in the hallway one day before class because it was common knowledge at AR Middle School that Mark always had uh, a cheat sheet, just a small little piece of paper, no frills, just the necessary numbers. And I approached him in the hall and I said, hey, hey, um, can, I get, can I get one of, those, one of those cheat sheets? He said, for a price. And I said, I'll... I'll do anything at this point. I just, I need, I need help. And so we worked out the details and the plan was in motion. It wasn't the first time that I'd been trapped. And to be honest, well, it wasn't the last. But I can tell you, no matter how big or small the problems that I find myself in, when I rely on my own intelligence and my own wit and ability, it's usually a recipe for disaster. You see, my, my playbook's just not very thick. I've only got a few things that I can do to try to get myself out of problems. And look, obeying would be complicated and confessing would be really messy. So I'm better just to dig my feet into the ground and look for a shortcut. And I can tell you, there aren't any shortcuts in Algebra 1 and there aren't any shortcuts in living a life of contrast either. And so I've got a few things that I can do to try to get myself out of these problems. I'll, I'll try to, I don't know, I'll, I'll try to hide it. If I've got a sin I can't get out of, I just try to hide it. I mean, after all, browser histories can be deleted. And I think that if I just do enough good things, and if I just know all the right Christian things to say, then maybe I can distract everybody from who I really am on the inside. But I, I can't sing enough praise songs, it seems like, to buy myself a clean conscience. So if I can't hide it, I'll try to fix it. And I'll say, you know what? That was it. That time was the last time, I promise you. And I, I try to pull my own self up out of the, the mess and try to will myself to not sin but I, I can't clean up my own messes. And I find myself like my two-year-old daughter who has taken to changing her own diapers. And guess what? She's not very good at it. And so I stand there, my hands messy, dressed like Winnie the Pooh. 
no pants. And if I can't hide it or fix it, well, then I get desperate and I just ignore it. Like if I, if I just close my eyes and, and turn the other way, I think, well, maybe this, thing, maybe this thing will go away. Maybe this problem that I've had for years will just magically resolve itself. And if I just don't talk about it, and if I just keep really, really quiet, maybe it will just fix itself. You know, like acne or America. but I, I know who I am. And I know that deep down inside, I'm, I'm a rebel. And no matter what I try to do, I find myself naked and ashamed and hiding. And God walks through the garden at night and, and calls my name. And I, I know the gig is up. And so this is what my heart looks like which I find it then really comforting when we look at our passage this evening, John, 1 John chapter 2. John, John writes, I think, something really intriguing at the very first part of this text. He says just three little words. My dear children. And I think John says a whole lot with just those three words. My. Do, do you get, do you catch the relationship that's involved with that? My, he doesn't say you guys, he says us. To say my implies covenant. It implies I'm in this with you, we're in this together. And if I could just kind of flip to the end of the evening, I want you to know that, I don't know, you, you might need to make a decision tonight. And you might be called upon to repent my deepest prayer for you in that moment is that you would find friends and adult leaders who would say, we love you and you're not going through this alone. Speaking of love, the next thing John says is, dear, do you get the, the compassion, the concern, the the emotional, heartfelt investment? You know, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but for some reason, when someone comes clean or, or confesses a sin, we want them to just pay. We want them to get everything that's coming to them and then we'll, we'll accept them after they do their time. And it's, it's kind of like the church sometimes communicates that confession is hazardous to your health. And it's no wonder that people stay in silence for so long. The third word, we're three words in, and John says, children. <laughs> children. An experienced, naive, they don't always make the right decisions. They really don't know what they're doing most of the time. And we're all ex-kids. We can admit this, that when you're a kid, you just don't know a lot. I mean, right? I mean, hopefully by now, you know a whole lot more than you did just five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eight, eleven years ago. But, but we think it's cute that God refers to us as his children. And we're like, oh God, that's so sweet. No, 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 no. God's simply reminding us that we are his kids and we have a long, long way to go. Now, Christianity is not about doing all the right things. Christianity is about knowing who your father is. We walked into the classroom and sat down and Mark took his place to my left. The teacher passed out the, the test. Mark began taking the test at an unusually fast rate. But after he filled out both sides of his test, he took the cheat sheet, put it on the floor as we had discussed, and with his foot slid it over to me. My instruction was then to meet his foot halfway through the aisle, put my foot on top of the, the cheat sheet, and then ever so slightly bend down and pick it up. As I was doing this and I made my way back to my desk, my eyes looked up and there was my teacher. I know. <laughs> I was there. She took my test 
took my cheat sheet and sent me home with a letter from my parents about their cheating son. Later that night, I threw myself on my parents' bed and I said, it's not fair. This is, this is all Mark's fault. My dad said, did you cheat? No, I didn't have a chance. <laughs> I spent the next hour pointing a finger at Mark and saying, this is all, this is all his fault. He, he, th he's the one to blame. He, he's the cheater. He, he's the one that made the cheat sheet. He got me into this. And I don't know why whenever I'm trapped, I'm so quick to point to somebody else who is just in a little deeper than me. And I, well, I guess that's because rebels make really poor advocates. John continues as we look at the fourth word and beyond in this text. He says this, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Hmm. Sin is the culprit in this story. But, but not like you think. You see, for me, and I don't know about for you, but for me, it's it's never been the big sins that have tripped me up, at least, at least at first. Because I have found myself throughout my life being able to sin and actually being pretty comfortable with my rebellion as long as I can point to somebody else and say, yeah, but have you, have you seen them? Or as long as I can say, yeah, but I mean, at least I'm not, I'm not sleeping with her. Oh, yeah, but, I mean, I, it's not like I, it's not like I said it to his face. And, I mean, come on, even if he, even if he knew, he, he would know I was, I was joking. Yeah, but, I mean, he, he made the cheat sheet. I, I'm convinced that the enemy will never come to you and say, hey, 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 hey. Put this on. Because we're like, no, you're the devil and that's a chain. <laughs> but what he will do is say, hey, 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 put, put, put this on. And we're like, well, that's just paper. And we'll put it on because, well, it's not, it's not that, but it's, but it's still a chain. And we get so comfortable in chains as long as, well, they're not those chains. You see, this whole problem with, are you more like Hitler or more like Mother Teresa, is that it's, it's spiritual quicksand. Because we tell ourselves, like, well, yeah, I mean, it's not like I, not like I moved to Calcutta or anything, but, you know, hey, I didn't start World War II either, so I'm, like, I'm good. I'm good. And, and we find ourselves stuck between a Nazi and a nun, which is what they should have called the sound of music, by the way, and... <laughs> and we get... So comfortable. Because as long as I'm on the grid somewhere between the best person in history and the worst person in history, I'm just average. And average is an okay place to be. Because nobody really calls out average. But Jesus shows up and he walks right past Mother Teresa and says, Hey! Hey! Hey, I, I'm the standard. Come, come stand by me. And we say, I can't. I got these chains. And before we even realize it, somehow, They've grown and they've changed from paper to metal. And we did.
didn't even see it coming. I laid on the bed and I said, Dad, Dad, they're going to they're gonna suspend me. That's what they do with cheaters. They're going to suspend me. My dad nodded and left the room. I heard him down the hall uh, making a phone call. And from as best I could tell, he wasn't ordering a pizza. I know that because he said the word algebra more than he said the word pepperoni. And that is a context clue. But he, a few moments later, came back into the room and sat down on the side of the bed next to me and said, well, we have a meeting tomorrow at the school with your teacher and the principal. Okay. And I'm going with you. Okay. I thought you were ordering pizza. <laughs> There's two things you need to know about my dad in, in this moment for this story to make sense. The first is this. He is the most loyal man I've ever met. This is a guy my entire life has shown up. He's been a guy who's just been there. In third grade, my Boy Scout leader was Freddie Wisner's older brother. Yes, that was his real last name. No, it was not easy for him to go through elementary school with a last name like Wisner. So, Freddie's older brother had been discharged from the army the summer before. We don't know why, but we assume that he had a lot of free time on his hands. So somebody who makes decisions thought, this man has disgraced our nation. I have an idea. Let's let him teach little boys how to start fires. <laughs> Private Wisner was relieved of his post. After, this is, this is all true, after one Boy Scout meeting, he took us into the boys' room of the local elementary school there, and one at a time had each of us fight him off fist to fist like he was a predator. <laughs> and I, I'm in third grade, and I'm going, I don't think there's a merit badge for this. The next week at the, the meeting, the regional director came in and had all the parents there and he was like, well, okay guys, uh, we've got these boys here. They don't know how to do much. Uh, they can fight, but other than that, they have no merit badges. We need someone to step up and lead these Boy Scouts. My dad on the way to the school that night, we walked the three houses to my elementary school, had told me, hey listen, if they ask for an adult to help and volunteer, I, I just can't. I'm, I'm, over, I just, I'm just doing too much. There's so much going on. I got work and all this other stuff. Like, I want to. I just can't do it. Okay. But when the regional director said, can anybody help out? My dad said, I'll do it. Because he showed up. The second thing is, my dad grew up in that town. He, he had gone to that very middle school. In fact, there were still teachers who were teaching me that 25 years earlier had had Danny Epperson in class. So when he walked into that, that office that morning, he was putting a whole lot on the line. Because to top it all off, of course, he was a legendary student. And he risked his reputation that morning for me. And all kids at some point disappoint their parents. That morning just happened to be mine. Now, was that, does that even come close to what Jesus did for us and for me? Of, of course not, of course not. But what it does tell me, what it does show me, is just what an advocate does. You see, John continues. This next line says this, but if anybody does sin, spoiler alert, we all will. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is, atone, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This, ad, this word advocate is such an, an interesting word. I think it's actually a pretty powerful word. Because an advocate is somebody with some sort of standing or authority that walks into a courtroom with someone without any status or authority at all and, and puts their arm around them and says, they're with 
me. My reputation is theirs. And that means this. If Jesus is your advocate, he's not ashamed of you. And if Jesus is your advocate, he's not embarrassed to be seen with you. And even when we feel just gross, he comes in and he puts his arm around us and he says, she's mine. She's mine. And knowing that should fill us with this really strange mixture of, of confidence and humility. The book of Hebrews actually says that through Christ, we're able to walk into the very presence of God with confidence, not because of what we've done, but because of who he is. And there is such freedom as a follower of Jesus knowing that I am so, so messed up, but so, so loved at the same time. We walked into the principal's office. He'd greet us at the door and we walked in and my teacher was already sitting there in the office and I sat down in a chair and the adults exchanged pleasantries and the principal then walked behind his desk and kind of fluffed up his tie and sat down and my test was sitting on his desk. My name, nothing else. He picked up the test and he looked at me and then he looked at the test again and he said, did you have a cheat sheet? And I sheepishly answered, yes. And I don't know if it was the mahogany, but something in that moment just really weighed on me. And I, I recognized just how, just how lost I was. And I, I hated, I hated what I had done. And I hated that I had embarrassed my dad like I did. And, most of all, I just hated algebra. <laughs> Principal looked over his glasses and started into a lecture about how terrible cheating was and how what a, what a disgrace I was to the family. And if I kept this up, I was going to ruin my academic record and my academic career, and I'd be a disgrace to the whole town. And the principal was just really getting warmed up into this lecture, and I was just staring at the floor when my dad said, now that'll be just about enough of that, Ed. My dad called the principal by his first name in front of a minor. This just got real. And you know, maybe it's time that we, we call Satan by his first name too. Because Satan actually means the accuser which means that he makes his living telling you all the things that you've done. And he whispers to you and says, hey, 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 I, I saw that, and I know, I know they don't know that, and we should, probably, we should probably keep it that way, because if they knew, if they knew who you really are, then no, there, there's no way they'd let, you, they'd let you serve in the church like you're doing. Man, if they knew, oh my gosh, everybody would be so disappointed in you. In fact, you'll never, you'll never outlive that. That will define you forever. And we know the voice. It's the voice that tells you how dumb you are and how bad you are and how foolish you are and how stupid you are. But if you listen closely, there's also another voice who says, now that'll be just about enough of that. Because I, I saw what she did too. And I paid for it. So that thing no longer defines her. That attitude, no, that, that's, that's not him anymore. His identity is now in me. My principal was reeling because an adult had said his first name in front of a kid. And in that moment, my dad seized the opportunity and said, okay, I, I'll make you a deal. I'll make you a deal. What if right here in the office, we let him take the test again? And if he does poorly, move him to pre-algebra. But suspending him, it's not going to help anybody. This, this was not part of the plan. I, I did not want to take that test again. 
or for the first time. But the adults, they all seemed to think it was a wonderful idea. And so they all got up and they put the, te the test on the principal's desk. I walked around the principal's desk and sat behind it. And then I took the test again, right there in the principal's office. My dad left the room and went outside and sat down on the front steps of Alice Robertson Middle School. About 15 minutes later, I exited through the front doors. My dad looked over his shoulder and said, how'd you do? I made a 55. And my dad said without even turning around, no wonder you cheated. <laughs> and then my dad said this, he said, you know, I, I knew you weren't going to do well, but I needed you to see it too. My own father threw me to the wolves. <laughs> but isn't it funny how similar discipleship and discipline sound? And I sat down next to my father on the steps of Alice Robertson Middle School and he said, Eric, how do we get into this mess? I shrugged. I don't know. He said, Eric, it's, it, I'm your dad, and it's, it's, it's my job. It's my job to, to protect you and to help you. But you gotta let me do my job. Why, why didn't you say anything? And then I said the same thing I've said a hundred hundred times when I've been trapped and I've been holding it in. I said, I, I don't know. I, I, I thought you'd be mad. I thought, I thought you, would, you wouldn't understand. I, I, thought I, was, I thought I was the only one struggling. I, I didn't think it was was that big of a deal. My dad said, so you know this means you need to move to pre-algebra, don't you? Oh, dad, no, not, not, not pre-algebra. I just, I just didn't know how I would tell my friends and how I'd explain to them why I'm not in this class, but I'm in this class. And I just don't think I could, I could take that kind of failure and embarrassment, but you see what my dad was doing, right? He wasn't punishing me, he was, he was freeing me. And what felt like a restriction was actually opening me up to have an opportunity to live a much better life. And I moved to pre-algebra, not, not because he made me, I moved because I trusted him. And I trusted him, well, because I saw what he did for me. And, and Jesus got a hold of me the exact same way. And John continues, he says this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and, and the truth Truth isn't in him. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. You know, I, I, spent, I spent so many years of my life thinking that I had just somehow like squeaked by. And I was always confident of my salvation, but I always thought I had just, through Jesus, had just discovered some kind of cheat code. But God was still pretty mildly irritated with me and just kind of always disappointed in me. And I just had to do enough right things so that maybe he would smile at me every once in a while. But what John is telling us is this. He says, no, 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 no. We do good we follow Jesus because he already loved us and already gave everything for us, not the other way around. And when I consider what Jesus has done for me, when I look at the cross, it would be silly of me 
not to trust him. For Jesus to put his arm around me and say, hey, listen, I, I need you to do this. Or I, I need you to live this way. For me to go, nah. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I got this algebra thing down. I got it down. 55, that's more than 50%. Solve that equation, Jesus. No. Because Jesus says in the book of John that he wants the best life for me. And the only way I get that is if I just trust him. And I've followed Jesus for a few years now. I can tell you that every time I listen to him, he's never let me down. If I just obey and not rebel. And so maybe Jesus is looking at you tonight saying, I need you to. And tonight might be the night to say, I don't want to, which you can say, you can be honest. I don't want to, but I'll trust you. Because, you know, I, I don't know how you got into this mess. But I know the way out. <laughs>